Good morning, Blooming Grove, and thank you for joining me online. Uh, as many of you may be aware, the restrictions on churches here in Illinois have been lifted, which means that Blooming Grove is now open for in-person services. We are taking a lot of precautions, you know, practicing social distancing and limiting the number of people that are in the building at any one time by having multiple services. So if you're interested in joining us for an in-person worship service, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, you can message us on Facebook or give, give us a call at the church building. Um, and, uh, and of course, we will continue to be streaming online just as we have been all throughout quarantine as well. Uh, and so you're welcome to just continue joining us right here each and every Sunday. And if you have been with us for the last few Sundays, then you know that we are four weeks into a five-part series called God on Film. Most people love movies. You know, big-budget films move our imagination and capture our attention. But as Christians, God calls us to be discerning, which means evaluating the movies we watch through the filter of our faith. In other words, it's important for us to think Christianly, to think biblically about the movies that we watch and the messages that they convey. So throughout this series, I hope to help you do just that by deconstructing some of the characters and thematic elements of Hollywood's recent, recent releases to see what they might reveal about life, faith, and God. In week one, we unpacked the fast-paced, family-friendly film Sonic the Hedgehog, which explores the very relevant themes of isolation, intelligence, and insignificance. In week two, we delved into the classic man and dog adventure, The Call of the Wild, which touches on the concepts of coveting, coping, and calling. Last Sunday, we explored Pixar's animated epic Onward, which prompted audiences to stop our forgetting, seek our Father, and support our family. And today, we're going to dig into the action-packed buddy cop movie, Bad Boys for Life. Now, like I said last week, unlike the other movies in this series, Bad Boys is not a family-friendly film. It is R-rated and for good reason. It's filled with foul language. So I only recommend watching this movie if you do so on VidAngel or ClearPlay. VidAngel and ClearPlay are streaming services that connect with your existing Netflix or Amazon account and allow you to filter the movies and TV shows you watch uh, by removing uh, inappropriate content and language. It's like watching a, a movie that's been edited for TV. So if you want to learn more about that, there's a, a link in the description. But with that disclaimer out of the way, let's go ahead and watch this trailer together. Mike, we got more time behind us than in front. Please. I'm going to be running down criminals till I'm 100. Not me. I'm going to be tired. It's time we be good men. It's bad for life. Marcus. Somebody's trying to kill me. Who wants to kill you? Who does? Put my name up there. We got it, Marcus. We appreciate it. But family is the only thing that matters. So I'm not letting you go on a suicide mission alone. That's what I like, teamwork. It's official. I survived what I've been through. Y'all got drama. The cycle continues. Go Wife's car. Cover the front door. She knows. She always knows. Bad boy for life. In this guns blazing, explosion packed action movie, aging Miami detectives Mike Lowry and Marcus Burnett, played by Will Smith and Martin Lawrence, face off against a mother and son pair of vicious drug lords who wreak vengeful havoc on their city. Between the high-speed car chases and helicopter crashes, however, Bad Boys manages to raise some significant theological questions. First, Bad Boys tackles the topic of violence. Violence. Action movies have a long history of violence with an ever-increasing body count, but few movies actually pause to consider the morality of such violence. 
When his partner is gunned down and hospitalized by a would-be assassin, Detective Marcus prays in the hospital chapel, asking God to spare his partner's life. Dear God, it's me, Marcus, he begins. You've blessed me with a lot of stuff lately, and I know I haven't been to church in a while, probably Easter. I haven't lost faith, it's just I was ashamed of some of the stuff we have to do. I know thou shalt not kill, but they were bad guys, all of them. If you could please just find it in your heart to give Mike one more chance. He's my best friend, my brother. If you spare him, I swear to you, I will put no more violence in this world. When his partner Mike recovers from his injuries, Marcus proves to be true to his word, at least for a while. He retires from the police force and starts attending church regularly. Uh, he even listens to a, a self-help audio book that focuses on God's healing. When the assassin reemerges, however, Marcus agrees to help Mike uh, investigate who shot him. Marcus tries to keep his promise to God. Uh, he avoids the fighting and refuses to shoot or even hold a gun, often at his own expense. But when he and Mike repeatedly find themselves in kill or be killed situations, Mike urges Marcus to join the fray. No, 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 Marcus replies. I made a promise to God. But Marcus persists. Who do you think sent you that weapon? That is God's gun sent to you in your time of need. You are a vessel for the Lord's work, like David and Goliath. This is your slingshot to smite your enemies. After hearing Mike's speech, Marcus finally agrees to defend himself and his partner, shouting, yeah, bad boys of the Bible, baby, before opening fire on the bad guys. This whole scenario raises a weighty question for Christians. Is it ever permissible to kill another human being? The, uh, in, the, in the scene, Marcus alluded to the Ten Commandments when he said, I know thou shalt not kill. The command actually says in Exodus 20, verse 13, you must not murder. Murder, the unlawful, unjust, premeditated killing of another human being is consistently condemned all throughout Scripture. The appalling death of George Floyd, which has triggered so much chaos and conflict throughout our country, was murder, or at the very least manslaughter, which the Bible also condemns. The 11 or more people who have been shot or beaten to death in these rage-fueled riots is also murder. And Christians need to speak out against this kind of violence. It's wrong. Not all killing, however, is considered murder. As Mike mentioned in the movie, David is a, a good example. David was a warrior king who not only slew Goliath, but led Israel in numerous military victories. When David killed Goliath, he did so as a soldier defending the kingdom of Israel uh, from slaughter and enslavement at the hands of the Philistines. In another instance, David and his fellow warrior Eleazar uh, stood alone against an entire battalion of Philistines when the Israelite army fled in fear. And the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 10, he killed Philistines until his hand was too tired to lift his sword. And the Lord gave him a great victory that day. So here we see God aiding David in what was a, a very violent victory. But again, David was defending himself and his country against an invading army. I think there's more than enough evidence in Scripture to conclude that there are situations in which soldiers, police, or even private citizens are justified in taking another person's life, 
in self-defense, or in defense of others. However, that doesn't mean that murder or manslaughter is ever condoned. And it sh certainly shouldn't be glamorized or, or glorified. You know, most police officers and soldiers, when forced to take the life of another human being, are genuinely traumatized by it. Our world needs less violence, not more of it. Jesus warned Peter in Matthew chapter 26, verse 52, Put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. In other words, violence begets more violence. And that's exactly what we're seeing in our world right now. Marcus's desire to put no more violence in this world is a noble one, and one that we should all strive to achieve. And even though the Bible allows for violence in certain life-threatening situations, it clearly condemns violence motivated by rage or racism or revenge and the like. And that last one, revenge, turns out to be a problem for Will Smith's character, Mike. In addition to violence, Bad Boys also addresses the theme of vengeance. While Marcus seems motivated by a genuine desire to do no violence, his partner Mike is driven by a desire for vengeance. After recovering from his gunshot wounds, Mike tries convincing Marcus to help him track down the shooter. But Marcus, seeing the look in his partner's eyes, replies, I'm telling you, Mike, if you go out there looking for vengeance, you're going to get someone killed. And Mike snaps back, that fool put holes in me. And Marcus answers, and you're filling them with hate, Mike. When Marcus refuses to help, Mike employs excessive and unacceptable levels of violence in pursuit of the assassin who shot him. And eventually Mike discovers that the shooter is actually his own estranged son, whom he didn't even know existed. Spoiler warning, by the way, that's a little late for that. But uh, even, even that discovery doesn't dampen Mike's desire for vengeance. So what are you going to do when you see him? His partner asks. Are, are you going to put your own son behind bars? Nope, Mike coldly replies. I'm going to kill him. And Marcus warns Mike, you realize you will go to hell. Mike replies, I don't believe in hell, Marcus. But Marcus continues, well, it believes in you. Killing your own son, brother, that is darkness that will swallow you whole. The desire to get even seems to be woven into the human psyche. Revenge and retaliation are natural instincts. In a rather similar story in the Old Testament, however, David, once again, shows us a better way. David's victory over the, the hulking Philistine Goliath won him the admiration and affection of everyone in Israel. Everyone except, that is, King Saul. King Saul saw David's victory and, and valor as a threat to his throne. And so he tried repeatedly to kill David. But when given the opportunity to pay Saul back for all the harm that he had done, David chose a different path. He showed Saul mercy and spared his life. And then David announces in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 12, May the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you are trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. Rather than take revenge on his enemy, David put the matter into God's hands. We all have, you know, a Saul in our lives. It might be an employer who unfairly fired you. It might be a spouse who abandoned you or parents who failed you. It could be a friend that betrayed you. Whatever the case, now you live in the backwash of mistreatment. You've been done wrong, and maybe you're just sitting around waiting for your opportunity to get even. Instead, do what David did. Trust God to be the judge. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Never take your own revenge, beloved, 
but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God occupies the only seat in heaven's supreme court. He wears the robe and refuses to share the gavel. Only God dispenses perfect justice and punishment. Vengeance is his job. So rather than punishing the people who cause you pain, leave your enemies in God's hands. And finally, in addition to violence and vengeance, Bad Boys also speaks to the subject of virtue. Marcus sums up a major theme of the movie when he tells Mike, hey look, all our lives we've been bad boys, right? Now it's time for us to be good men. Mike just laughs it off saying, who would want to sing that song? He doesn't recognize the truthfulness of Marcus's words until the end of the movie when he finally lets go of his desire for vengeance and spares his son's life. More importantly, his son does the same. After their climactic confrontation, Mike's son Armando helps his father to rescue Marcus from certain death and then allows the two of them to arrest him peacefully. In the final scene, Mike visits his son in prison and asks, how you doing? And Armando answers, I'm paying my debt. And it's a big one. Even Armando, the villain of the story, in the end, wasn't beyond redemption. He confessed his crimes and accepted his punishment. He and Mike both grow up in a sense. They stop living like bad boys and start acting more like good men. And Christians are similarly called to, to grow up. The Apostle Paul, for instance, writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, When I was a child... I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away or put the ways of childhood behind me. So what's the difference between a bad boy and a good man in God's eyes? Well, again, the Apostle Paul speaks to that quite a bit in the book of Colossians. First, he describes the bad behavior of the old self, as he calls it, in Colossians 3, verses 5 through 8. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. He then goes on to describe what we are to grow into. That's, that's what we're supposed to grow out of. And then he describes in the next section what we are supposed to become, the men and women we're supposed to be. He says in Colossians 3, verse 12 through 14, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And there is nothing virtuous about immature, ungodly behavior, but compassion, kindness, humility, forgiveness, and love, these virtues are characteristic of good men and good women of God. And perhaps we could all do a little growing up still. As the, the culmination of a trilogy 25 years in the making, Bad Boys for Life is a bit of a, a cinematic surprise, at least for me. While the overabundance of profanity is certainly a strike against it, Despite its shortcomings, Bad Boys for Life circles some significant theological issues and tends to land in the right place. Marcus's spiritual awakening reminds us that violence, even when justified in the, the line of duty, is, isn't something that we should glorify or glamorize. Mike's 
quest for vengeance serves as a, a cautionary tale, reminding us never to seek revenge, but instead to, to leave our enemies in God's hands. And Marcus's desire to see his partner change from a bad boy to a good man reminds us that we all need to be more virtuous as we grow up in our faith and in Christ Jesus. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, I, I hope that you'll join me again next week as we conclude this God on Film series by taking a look at the faith-based film, I Still Believe. In the meantime, let's pray together. Lord, I praise you once again for revealing your truth in unlikely places. I ask that you will help us to become more discerning about the movies we watch and the messages they convey. May you help us create a less violent world. May we never seek vengeance against those who wrong us. And may we all be filled with your Spirit so that we can embody the virtues of goodness and godliness. May we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Once again, you know, as always, if you have any prayer requests or praises, please feel free to leave those in the comments section or post them in our Facebook group. Um, if you'd like the opportunity to continue giving during quarantine, uh, there's a, a link to our online giving in the description below. And if you are interested in joining us for in-person services, please reach out to us and let us know. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you next Sunday.